In the grand tradition of underemployed artists, Eden Robbins has been a singing waitress, a dildo salesman, a dental assistant, an abortion clinic receptionist, a blowjob instructor, a travel writer, a pelvic model, and a Swahili teacher. She wrote a novel that is currently in the death rattle stage of its edits and is co-founder and co-editor of the semi-prosine Brain Harvest. Please welcome Eden Robbins. beginning of my novel, entitled The Grand Adventure of Ought Nine. How does one write the letter that needs to explain a lifetime of mistakes? Fiona chewed on the cap of her pen and stared at the empty page. A donkey bleated outside the window, its foot stomping too close to the crumbling sandstone walls of the cafe. Sunlight flickered as the donkey paced, now plunging the cafe into shadow, now filling it with light. Outside on the street, giants shouted and shoved, oblivious to anything but themselves. They were crass, inattentive, and self-involved, but this came as no surprise to anyone in the cafe who had, of course, the opposite problem. When one is no taller than the finger of a giant, one must pay excruciatingly close attention. Too many of their kind had been lost to an errant foot, the casual swipe of a giant hand, and so the men in the cafe held one shaking hand on their coffee cups and one foot pointed toward the back exit. Their conversations were stilted and uneasy. One man trailed off, another lost the thread of his story, another asked irrelevant questions. An eavesdropper couldn't follow the conversation if he wished to. This was the way of intimacy among such men. However, the class of gentlemen adventurers should be considered an exception to this rule. They thrive on the threat of being stomped, drowned, accidentally swallowed. They yearn to know all they can about the world in which they are invisible. They even seek to conquer it in their way. Fiona was one such gentleman adventurer, and if you called her thusly, she would tip an imaginary top hat to you, bowing deeply at the waist, merely a humble servant, she'd say, to the greater pursuit of truth. She did not seem to notice the stomping donkey, and she did not have a foot pointed toward safety, much to the dismay of the other, more prudent men sitting in the cafe, who thought adventurers brought chaos with them wherever they went, putting everyone around them in danger. Adventurers upset the very tenuous balance they all lived in together, which was selfish and foolhardy, was it not? They whispered loudly that it was probably her donkey. A ridiculous notion that that was. The cafe's proprietor in particular, having spent years searching for the perfect tucked away location at the base of a perfect building for his business, eyed her with fear. He considered adventurers to be possessed of an even more dangerous quality than gins and found them infinitely more capricious. But Fiona paid them no mind. She sipped from her thick, sweet coffee and continued to stare at the page in front of her. Dear Teeny, I... Fiona frowned, wiped her forehead, and the silver streaked black hair stuck to it with sweat. She wrote, never, crossed it out, wrote, love, crossed that out, wrote, am, paused, sipped her coffee again. She grimaced, tongue-tied even on paper. Where were the right words to be so close and still so very far? More coffee, miss? Fiona looked up to a little boy who held a silver carafe over her cup. His eyes were on the donkey, his shaking hand sloshing the coffee around in the carafe. Fiona smiled, lips closed, a trail of sweat slid through her smile lines. She barely remembered being young enough to be called Miss. Yes, thank you, she said, steadying the carafe with one hand so the boy would not spill on her. Shukran. The boy filled her cup and skittered away. Fiona stared at the page some more, willing it to fill with words. The donkey stopped, snagging his hoof on the outside wall of the building that concealed the cafe. Sandstone crumbled around the window opening. A puff of dust curled through the crack that marked the front door. One man jumped up from his table with a cry and skipped out the back, knocking his cup off the table and spilling a ribbon of coffee on the floor, which promptly soaked into the dust. His aged and mustachioed companion interrupted in the middle of a story about this or that. Does a, subject, does a story subject matter if its listener is not listening? Steady the table, irritated as always by the petty knee-jerk emotions of his fellows. 
so much fear, so little thought. Known to those who mattered as the great adventurer Teeny, the mustachioed man was currently unintentionally in disguise as he found himself, to his profound embarrassment, sans traveling vest which was probably, he reasoned, why Fiona did not speak to him, or so much as look in his direction. <laughs> After the first patron ran out, there was no shame in following him, so the remainder fumbled in the folds of their clothes for chains to pay their bills. Even the small boy with the carafe and his father, the wary proprietor, stood in the back doorway of their cafe, ready to leave and find another crack in another of Marrakesh's sandstone buildings, if they must. Teeny took a slow, deliberate sip of his coffee, challenging them with his calmness. What a different breed they were from him, Fiona, or even dear Boston, these frightened men who refused to engage with the larger world around them. To the small clan of gentlemen adventurers, understanding the giants was indeed part of their life's work. However, despite their many discoveries and much to their general annoyance, most of their kind remained willfully ignorant but some things were universally understood, such as the giants could carry on conversations without worry as to being crushed beneath a giant sack of peppers. <laughs> the giants could hear the fascinating tales of a new friend's exploits over several cups of Turkish coffee and never have to race out the back door when a donkey kicked up a crumb of dust. They could finish books and finish meals before they grew cold. They could stretch out carelessly in long expanses of time as though in a bubble bath. But those who were of a philosophical bent found this quality of the giants to be an extravagant luxury. One becomes proud of one's attention to detail, of one's appreciation of the minute. One becomes used to one's customs. Without the rustle of robes, the clicking of cups, and the distraction of his own voice telling stories, Teeny began to feel utterly exposed. He regarded Fiona baldly from across the empty cafe. It seemed impossible that she should be so lifelike sitting there like, just like any other person. It seemed impossible that he could actually finally be sitting there with her in the same damn room after all this time. Something was rattling and Teeny looked, Teeny looked around in irritation only to discover that his own gnarled hand shook, rattling his cup against its saucer. Why should he be so terrified? He, who had escaped the hungry maw of a Bengal tiger in 76, squeezing triumphantly between the canine and incisor teeth and leaping to safety. The old tiger had loose front teeth owing to age and malnutrition, and in a moment of ingenuity, Teeny had swung them open like a barroom door and left to safety. <laughs> yes, he had faced much more terrifying adversaries. Not that Fiona was an adversary, not exactly. <clears throat> what a fool you are, he said to himself. Talk to her. That's what you came all this way for, wasn't it? All the trouble. It was to get you here, so talk to her. But though his brain commanded it, his muscles would not obey. And still, impossibly, Fiona remained oblivious, focused so completely on her work. Teeny ached inside from a terrible ambivalence. He knew what she was working on, her life's work, far more important than anything he had to offer. The work had been her constant companion. What a fool he was to think he could take its place after all this time. She had far surpassed him as an adventurer. All he had ever done was chase her around the world. Teeny pressed his fingers into his eyelids until his vision sparkled. What was he to her anymore? He noted the furrows in her eyebrows, which he remembered as transient folds of smooth skin, which which had now become deeply etched lines. He scribbled all this onto his napkin, taking notes as though he was an impartial observer instead of an anguished participant. He paused, then wrote, coward, to taunt himself. And yet. Teeny willed her to sense his thoughts, to feel the presence of one aged yet still dashing gentleman adventurer with well-oiled mustaches, ripped khakis, and no traveling vest or hat, but she did not look up. Perhaps she was too staunch of an anthropologist to lend credence to such super superstitious ballyhoo. Anthropologists may study the ballyhoo, but they must not subscribe to it. <laughs> Teeny envied her focus and her drive. Fiona pressed her fingertips to the letter, daring herself to crumple it up, disgusted that after all of these years, she was still unable to say what she needed to say. What was the point of leaving a trail of oneself? Even if it was followed, she would still always be one lonely step ahead. It was time to stop pretending her life could be otherwise. This was the bed she had made, and she was old, old enough to know better, certainly. 
She crumpled the letter and tossed it to the floor. It was just paper, after all, and it was best not to get too attached to things. She stood up fast, knocking her chair backward, already halfway to the door. Teeny choked on his coffee. Right now? When he was so close to speaking to her? He grabbed his hip and willed it to straighten. He tried to take a step forward, tried to say something, but his voice caught in his throat. He couldn't let her leave. His one chance couldn't pass before it had even arrived. But the donkey, weary of being subjected to the inconsiderate of its absent master, huffed and stomped and finally kicked the crack in the wall that marked the front exit of the cafe. An avalanche of rock and sand flooded the cafe, knocking down tables, filling the air with impenetrable dust. Teeny, limping and grunting, managed to climb atop the bar at the far end of the cafe, covering his nose and mouth and straining to see some outline of Fiona or a cry for help. Fiona, he yelled. Fiona, I'm here. But he choked on the thick dust, drying out his throat as soon as his mouth opened. There was no way she could hear him if she was indeed still in there hiding safely, no doubt, like he was, wasn't she? His throat seized. He knew he should wait until the dust settled, but now that he had decided to act, waiting was the last thing Teeny wanted to do. And so he slid down from the bar, his hip acting up again now that the adrenaline had ebbed. The rock avalanche had slowed to a stop. Undoubtedly, a giant had taken the donkey away, or another stolen it, as they were wont to do. Mister, the dust is too thick. It is no good to search. The little boy materialized out of the haze, hopping from rock to rock. Where did you come from? asked Teeny. You need to be careful. The little boy shrugged, kicking the rocks around. Did you see a woman, the woman in here before? Teeny asked, not sure he wanted to hear the answer. She is gone, said the boy. Did you see her leave? Did you see her fall? asked Teeny. The boy shrugged coyly. She is gone. Don't play with me, boy. He made grand charades with his hands and spoke at a high volume. Did she, he made his two fingers walk on his open palm, <laughs> leave? Or did she? He started to mime a person falling beneath the rubble, but he couldn't bring himself to do it. Fiona, he shouted, coughing. Fiona, can you hear me? The little boy giggled, hopped from one rock to another, singing to himself, she is gone, she is gone. <laughs> Stop that, snapped the man. Excuse <clears throat> me. He looked at the little boy sharply. She left then, is that what you mean? She got out? The boy stopped singing, stared at him wide-eyed. What's that in your fist? Teeny asked, pointing to the boy's hands, which held a crumpled piece of paper. It's mine, said the boy. I found it. Give me that, said Teeny, holding out his hand. That doesn't belong to you. I found it, yelled the boy. Give it to me! He uncurled the boy's fingers from the paper and smoothed it on a tabletop. This is precious, he said by way of apology for his rough behavior. It is uh, an artifact. Do you know what this means, artifact? It is a difficult English word. Of course, the boy said, rubbing his hand. Every foreigner looks for the things dead people leave behind. Fiona is not dead, Teeny said, pounding his fist on the bar top. The dust bloomed around him and he choked again. The child jumped and backed away. I'm sorry, boy, he said. How about a nice, shiny American quarter for your trouble? He reached into his pocket and held the small coin out in his palm, but the boy shook his head. No, said Teeny. Since when did foreign children refuse shiny American quarters? The dust had settled, revealing a pile of rocks and rubble that reached halfway to the ceiling. If Fiona was buried under there, she wasn't. She wouldn't be. She was an adventurer, and adventurers do not die buried under a pile of rocks, not with the love of their life so tragically close. He brushed the dust from the piece of paper. Through a mess of pain and regret, Teeny felt a tiny, guilty surge of triumph at acquiring Fiona's notes, clues about the life that she had kept at arm's length from him. He would finally, finally have some answers, however mundane, to the riddle of Fiona. That would do, would have to do, for now. He held out the paper and squinted. Dear Teeny, I never loved Anne. Teeny pressed his hand to his chest and could almost feel the palpitations therein, which, this time, were not age-related. 